All right. So hopefully everyone who's joining us online can hear me as well as you in the room. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluating carcass compost for corn production in a cold climate. And as Mary said, it sounds like I need to make sure I am moving, continuing to move. So I will talk a little bit fast. One of the things, uh, give you a background, especially since I'm the one starting off this program today, we know that with our um, carcass mortality, we're usually dealing with large amounts of carcasses due to highly pathogenic outbreaks. So for instance, in Minnesota specifically, we dealt with a swine flu in 2009. We had the avian influenza in 2015, and then unfortunately we're dealing with it now in 2022 as well. That's usually when we've had to deal with these like large amounts of carcasses. Recently, we've also had to deal this during the COVID-19 outbreak as well, where we had um, you know, supply chain issues and we needed to kind of euthanize a lot of hogs because there's just no market for them. What was interesting about this is this gave us an opportunity, especially in our state, to kind of practice what we would do if a highly pathogenic like African swine fever came through the state. So we're able to practice, put all of our protocols in place, practice what was going to happen, and think about disposal methods without having to worry about then further spreading a disease. So we weren't doing it in the middle of a pandemic, for instance, just a different kind of pandemic. So in Minnesota, we have four ways that we can dispose of carcasses. Uh, we can bury them, we can incinerate them, we can landfill them, or we can compost them. And those are like the four legal methods in our state. Incineration and landfill were the primary methods that were used for a long period of time, but they're becoming more limited. One, a lot fewer landfills are accepting carcasses, especially in the large scale situation where we have a mass mortality event. We also are seeing less and less of our incinerators accepting these carcasses as well. So that's becoming more limited. Burial is, you got to have suitable land. One in Minnesota, you can only use burial if the water, groundwater table is a certain distance below where you're going to bury them. So that makes, you know, some land in our state unsuitable. And then I don't know if you know this about Minnesota, but we have something called winter and it's very frozen and you can't bury things very well there. So that kind of makes, I don't know, it feels like nine months of the year where you can't do anything. It's not that bad, but you know, it is a certain period of time making burial pretty difficult to do. So that leaves us with composting. Um, recent work has showed like no one really believed they're like, you can't compost in the winter either, but we really started to try to promote this as an alternative means because of the limitations of the other methods of disposal. Uh, so recent research through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, and the USDA's APHIS, which is Animal Plant Health Inspection System. No, I forget what the S stands for. But it was a coordination where they were testing winter carcass composting. Again, kind of through this COVID outbreak and with the pandemic, um, we had a lot of carcass mortalities that we needed to deal with. So I can show you some photos of that. In this case, we wanted to make sure, like they went in the dead of January, so dead of winter in Minnesota. It was very cold the days that we started these trials. And the idea was we wanted to make sure that the heating started up really, really fast. So they actually ground the carcasses with the, car with the carbon source in order to really kind of jumpstart the process. Um, so that's what we see here. Things are being ground and then put into windrows. And then they kind of monitored temperatures and the composting process throughout uh, the winter then and throughout the active stages. So again, um, they use this opportunity to really like practice like biosecurity measures and everything. So that's why you see folks out here with Tyvek suits. Again, we weren't worried about an animal disease outbreak at this time, but we were practicing all of the techniques that were needed to prepare for the next animal outbreak. Um, and these piles heated up very quickly. In fact, one of the piles, the commercial piles actually lit on fire spontaneously and they had to spread it out and it was kind of a huge disaster. So lessons learned, don't make your pile too big, which is what happened here. Luckily, this was not our research pile. So don't worry, we didn't get crispy compost. Um, but just again, kind of, it was really great that we had this opportunity. I know you don't, you don't ever want to hear of carcasses or mass disposal having to happen, but it gave us this opportunity to practice and learn things that you shouldn't do. 
So we had this unique opportunity in our state to use this carcass compost for land application. And what was cool about the winter process that they did is they used different carbon sources. So the idea was to see what kind of carbon sources could we pull in winter if a mass mortality event had to happen. Wood chips, corn stalks were the big ones. So they actually have piles of different carbon sources to test how they heated and that sort of thing. That gave us the opportunity to test these different carbon sources when applied to the field. Um, so that's what we did. And here I show you the composting period. We had one pile start in January, 2020. So you see it down here, we have the years 2020, 2021, and 2022, and then the months above that. So the first composting period started in January, 2022. Uh, we had the active, com or active phase that happened kind of through early spring. And then we had them sit and cure for a little over a year. Then we did the field study in 2021, and that's what I'll be presenting to you. But do know we have a second site um, started. So the second piles were started in January 2021, did the same thing. We also added wheat as a carbon source. Um, so I don't have that data with us today, but that is pending. So we are kind of here. Well, I'll tell you about the field study that we have, but do know we do have more results coming up. Also, we tested this at the Southwestern Research and Outreach Center in Minnesota. So you can see it's kind of in that southwestern region of Minnesota. So for the field study, as I mentioned, in this case, we had two carbon sources, wood chips, as well as corn stalks. We assumed that about 50% of the nitrogen was going to be available. With um, We don't have a lot of data in Minnesota about release of nutrients from composts. Uh, so we had to make an educated guess of what we thought it would be. We knew it wouldn't be 100% because of, you know, wood chips potentially binding some of that nitrogen. So we assumed it would be about 50%. You know, carcass compost is not a really super mature compost. It's not like that rich, dark, crumbly material that you would see coming out of like a gardening compost type of thing. So kind of went in between like a raw manure and what a like really fully mature compost would look like. So we assumed about 50%. Compared it with nitrogen fertilizer, and we did three different rates. For all of the nitrogen, we assumed the first year nitrogen availability, we wanted to apply about 80 pounds of nitrogen, 160 pounds, or 240. Usually, uh, and this is a corn on corn system, so usually we're aiming for about 200 pounds of nitrogen for corn production in Minnesota after it follows corn. So we wanted to go a little bit below that, a little bit above that to see kind of if we could figure out where the yields would peak out with these different nutrient sources. We also had a zero nitrogen control. We did apply fertilizer, phosphorus, and fertilizer, potassium, and sulfur across the entire study based on soil tests to make sure those were not limiting nutrients. We do realize that, of course, phosphorus and potassium, et cetera, were also applied with the compost. But again, because we applied a blanket rate across the field, we weren't expecting any deficiencies of these nutrients. So we're mostly focusing on the nitrogen in the compost. We did a randomized complete block design. So each, or each treatment was in one of these bands that you see in this photo here to the right. And um, there's four replicates. So everything was replicated four times. So just to show you our, um, some of the details of the carcass compost, we did have it tested. Can you see my mouse on the screen? You cannot. All right, so try to point out some things here. We have wood chips in the middle row there, corn stalks and the, to the furthest right. And pH was similar, but pH was a little bit lower for the wood chips, about neutral seven. It was a little bit higher for the corn stalks, about eight. Uh, moisture content differed between the different sources. We did have similar total nitrogen amounts, which allowed us to have very similar application rates. And you notice that most of the nitrogen was in the organic nitrogen form. Very little is in the ammonium and even less was in the nitrates. In fact, it was not even detectable nitrate levels in one of, in the um, corn stock carbon compost. C to N ratio, it's actually looked pretty low, 20.8 to one for the wood chips, 14.2 to one for the um, corn stocks. One of the things I want to point out is that these still had very big particulates in it. So the wood chips were very big. So in the lab, I like just knowing and working with labs, I know that they didn't, weren't able to grind up that material and fully test it for carbon and nitrogen. So I think some of the big chunks weren't really necessarily accounted for in here. So I think this carbon to nitrogen ratio is not like truly reflective of what the actual carbon to nitrogen ratio was. 
Phosphorus contents were very similar, about five pounds per ton. Potassium um, was a little bit higher for the corn stock compost, which you would expect, you know, corn takes up a fair amount of uh, potassium. But overall, they're all actually fairly similar materials considering. <laughs> so just to quickly summarize our yield results for the first year, uh, here we have yield in bushels per acre on the y-axis, ranging from zero to 200. Uh, all of our yields were very low. We ended up having a pretty severe drought, and it was particularly bad in this region in um, Minnesota. So all of our yields were really, really low. We were actually happy that we got any yield at all. So um, that's how bad it was this year. can see that for fertilizer, the plant available nitrogen rate is at the bottom here. So we applied again, 80, 160, and 240 pounds of nitrogen, even with the fertilizer. We did assume fertilizer was 100% available. But you can see with increasing nitrogen rates, you get an increasing yield with the fertilizer, which is the red line at the top. The blue line, which is dashed, is corn stock yields. We did see that the increasing rates increased yield up to about that 160 pounds of nitrogen rate. And I believe I also wrote the tons of compost that we put on, so 7, 14, or 21. It was all very similar to both sources, and we applied about the same plant available nitrogen rate. So up to about 14 tons per acre, we did not, or we saw an increase in yield, and then we saw an actual decrease after that. We think at that point, the kind of carbon to nitrogen ratio probably oversaturated the soil to the point where the nitrogen was actually being taken up out of the soil to try to decompose some of that corn compost. The wood chips did increase yield only at the seven tons per acre, not much, but it was a slight increase. And then it was down to about the same as having no nitrogen added at all control for 14 and 21 tons per acre. So basically suggesting that the corn with the wood chips, that compost was not really a significant nitrogen source at all. Didn't seem like it was decreasing yield, but it certainly wasn't providing any nitrogen in this case. We also um, took plant samples. So we took corn stalks, we took cobs, and we took grain, and we ground them, sent them in for analysis to get the nitrogen uptake of the different treatments. You can see here we have nitrogen uptake in pounds of nitrogen per acre from zero to 200. And then plant available nitrogen rate is the same across the x-axis. And basically nitrogen uptake reflects yield pretty, pretty strongly. Uh, so generally you see an increase for fertilizers as you increase nitrogen rate, you increase nitrogen uptake. For the corn stock compost, which is blue dash lines, again, that increased up into that 14 tons per acre and then it decreased and then not much nitrogen was taken up by the corn crop for the wood chip compost. One of the cool things we can do is that we can compare uh, because we know how much nitrogen we added in the fertilizer plots, we can compare the compost directly to those fertilizer plots and get a fertilizer equivalent value. So that's what we see here. We have our different application rates, our nitrogen, uh, assumed nitrogen additions that we were putting on for first year availability, the different types, corn stock, wood chip. And we have our fertilizer equivalent value in that second to last column there. And again, you can see that we did increase nitrogen equivalent value of the compost up to that 14 tons per acre for corn stock compost. We did actually provide some nitrogen um, once you actually looked at the nitrogen fertilizer equivalent values for with the wood chip compost, you know, ranging from nine to 41 pounds of nitrogen per acre, but overall it was pretty small. The last column there shows the percent nitrogen available of the total nitrogen we applied. Total nitrogen we applied will be this assumed plant nitrogen available times two, because we assumed 50% availability. So if we just subtract or divide the fertilizer equivalence value divided by how much total nitrogen you applied, you get the percent nitrogen that was available. And it ranged from 17 to 37% for corn stalks. We assumed 50, we got 17 to 37%. For wood chips, it was from two to 18%. So with the wood chips, it definitely decreased the nitrogen availability of the material. So again, we're repeating the experiment. We're also throwing in a third treatment. We'll have wheat as well, wheat straw. This is one of the things that some of our stakeholder farmers talked about that they might have wheat straw bales that they could also use as a carbon source. 
So they did add that uh, this upcoming year. So we'll hopefully have data on a third nutrient source or carbon source as well. So that's it. I know we only have very few minutes for questions, if any. Yeah, so but. we're probably going to skip questions here. Just let me let me just take a peek here real quick. Um, so I'm going to do online questions. And since the rest of us are in person and Melissa here the rest of the week, we can catch Melissa at the end mm -hmm. out in the hallway while we're visiting with vendors, while we're having lunch. Um, okay, so Melissa, were the only feedstocks the carbon source and, and mortality or was there manure included as well? In this case, it yeah. was only the carbon sources. And I don't believe there is any manure in these particular ones. I think it was just the carbon, the carcasses and the carbon in this case. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right, let's thank Melissa.